Hi class. Uh, welcome to the second lecture. This lecture today is on the general survey. Um, we are going to talk about the general survey, the mental status, uh, skin, hair, and nails today. So those are the topics that we're going to cover. It's a lot, so we're going to try to get through it um, fairly quickly because I don't want to make you guys listen to this recording for an hour or so. But um, the general survey is your assessment of the patient. It's your impression. It can include um, many different areas. Uh, it's parts of the neurologic and mental status, parts of the you know, state of health, the hygiene, grooming, body habitus, if the patient's in any pain or distress. Um, if we're talking about the review of systems that we talked about from last, uh, last semester, sorry, last lecture, then this section really corresponds to that constitutional section of the review of systems. But remember that the review of systems is subjective, meaning it's what the patient tells you. Whereas the general survey, what you're doing here is objective. It's your observations of what you see with the patient. So I like to start out um, this lecture by showing this picture. Um, the general survey really starts with the first moments of the patient encounter and includes all your observations. So this person obviously isn't in your clinic, but maybe you're a public health nurse and you're um, going out making rounds in the community, and this is your patient for today. So uh, your job is to um, complete the general survey of what you're seeing in this, in this patient. So the general survey includes things like state of health, um, signs of distress, the level of consciousness, maybe you know you shake this lady and she's completely obtunded and doesn't even wake up or kind of groans and rolls over and doesn't wake up, you know. Um, it includes her grooming and hygiene, maybe she reeks of alcohol and who knows what else. Um, and um, look at their motor activity as well. So all those things, these five things, state of health, signs of distress, level of consciousness, grooming and hygiene, and motor activity, all play into your general survey. Uh, sometimes it's obvious what we're observing. In this situation, it's obvious that the patient probably is not groomed appropriately unless, you know, this is what she's supposed to be looking like. Um, but um, you can probably make, sh you know, tell that the motor activity is off. But other times, things won't be as obvious or as blatant. Sometimes it's not as obvious and you need to make conscious and systematic observations. Sometimes you'll see a patient and they'll just look a little bit off, but you won't really be able to put your finger on it. If you learn what to observe, then you'll be able to figure out systematically what is off about the patient. So, um, for example, uh, I was on a, plane, uh, on a train going to New York when I was back living in Connecticut and I was sitting across and um, so kitty corner and a little bit behind this woman who was across the aisle from me and I kept staring at her because I was like you know there's something there's something off what is it I, I didn't know what it was I wasn't you know assessing her as a client um, but it took me the entire train ride before I figured out that oh she didn't have eyelashes so um, here I just knew that there was something off about this lady but um, didn't actually put it together that she didn't have eyelashes where if I was seeing her in the in my clinic, I would have systematically observed her um, and done her examination and, and probably been able to pinpoint that, oh, she doesn't have eyelashes, a little bit quicker. Another uh, example of this is you sort of observe and you see what you're used to seeing. So a skin, a dermatologist might only notice skin issues, whereas a um, respiratory, or, you know, a pulmonologist, someone who's specializing in pulmonology, um, notices clubbing of the fingernails all the time. Um, my husband is a plastic surgeon, and we were um, in San Diego a couple years ago. And this woman walks by, and she's got very, very large um, breast augmentation, so uh, large fake breast. And I asked my husband uh, after she had passed, I was like, do you think, so can you tell if those are above the muscle or, be, uh, or below the muscle implants? And I was just asking him some general questions about that. Well, um, and he was able to answer them. He was like, oh, you know, those ones I think were above the muscle. And, you know, he was obviously also noticed this woman um, because that's what he does. He does a lot of breast implants and a lot of breast um, augmentations. Um, not... Not three minutes later, 
a, a guy walks by who um, has his entire face, his entire torso and his arm, um, the arm that I could see, he was in like a tank top, was burned. He was burned, you know, part of his, you know, his hair, his face, everything, his neck was burned. Um, and after he walked by, I turned to my husband, like, what do you think happened to that guy? Like, do you think that was, you know, military related or, and my husband <laughs> looked at me and was like, huh, what are you talking about? He didn't even see the burn victim. Of course he saw the big giant um, breast augmentation, but he didn't see this guy with these terrible burns. So the story, the moral of the story is that you, you tend to see what you're used to seeing and you observe what you're used to seeing, but using a systematic approach, you can sort of widen your scope and make sure that you are assessing the patient in, um, in total. So when we talk about the state of health, we're talking about, you know, the normal things that you're going to say are the patient is, appears the stated age, they're fit, they're robust. An abnormal um, finding might be that they're older than stated age, that they're acute or chronically ill appearing. Um, not that they are acutely ill, but that they're acute and chronically ill appearing. They might appear cachectic, which is that kind of wasting, um, really frail and kind of wasted away. Uh, they might be obese, which is sort of the opposite of cachectic. Uh, you could notice some bitemporal wasting where the temples of the person's face have, have, um, have atrophied. And so you can see that bone by the temple above and lateral to the eyes. Uh, you can see that pretty commonly. Um, when we're talking about signs of distress, we're really talking about, is the, you know, what are you looking for in the patient? Do they, are they tearful? Are they crying? Are they, are they wincing? Are they in, um, acute respiratory distress, are they short of breath with conversation? Uh, a normal finding would be that they're in no apparent distress, and that's abbreviated very commonly NAD in the literature and in your medical, um, in your medical notes. So you can use the, uh, the abbreviation NAD. These patients, you would probably say they have signs of distress. So this gentleman on the left, you would say is clunch, clutching his chest. Obviously, you'd be concerned about some cardiac issues. Um, and then the lady on the right, what do you think? Yeah, headache, right? Uh, so wincing, eyes closed, rubbing her temples, things like that. When we go to level of consciousness, um, normally patients should be awake and responsive. That's your normal, um, your normal level of consciousness. Uh, their abnormal signs are going to be lethargic, obtunded, stupor, and coma. coma sorry. Um, I like to think of this as with lethargic, they wake to the voice. On obtunded, they respond to touch, so they uh, kind of arouse to touch. On stupor, they respond to pain. So this requires this painful stimuli. And then we know we all are probably familiar with coma. They don't um, really respond. With grooming and hygiene, you'll want to observe the individual's grooming and personal hygiene, looking for clues into their lifestyle, their personality, maybe their state of health and their, and their overall general status. You should notice if their clothes are clean or dirty, if there's holes in them, if they fit well. Are their clothes appropriate for the climate or the situation? You know, are they wearing a parka and a beanie hat in your office, which doesn't have air conditioning and it's 90 degrees? You know, we've all seen probably homeless people down at Waikiki who on a really hot day, they're still wearing you know, their parka, their long sleeves, their backpack, their, their um, beanies. Um, and there's reasons for that. You know, are they wearing sunglasses, which can hide quite a bit. I, have, I had a patient uh, many years ago who she was a young girl and would come in um, saying that she couldn't sleep. She hasn't slept in like two days. She was wearing sunglasses. Uh, I had her remove the sunglasses and her pupils were humongous. She had been on this giant, you know, bender and had been, um, had, I think she was on cocaine. I can't remember the, the entire story, but she had, she had, um, taken a lot of drugs and her pupils were huge. And that's probably, you know, that's obviously the reason she couldn't sleep. Uh, but wearing sunglasses, if you don't ask the patient to remove those, you can't see that. You can also see patients who are hiding back tearfulness, patients who have black eyes from potential fights or domestic abuse. Uh, you'll want to notice any obvious odors like alcohol, uh, tobacco, any mouth odors which could have, um, which could indicate an abscess. I had a patient that not too long ago. I had a patient in the nursing home, um, and the nurse was like, you know, can you go see this lady? Her breath, her mouth really is stinky, and I didn't have time that day, so I just, I told her, you know, here, here's some order for, um, you know, this mouthwash to help kind of rinse her mouth out. 
And the next day, or two days later, I was there again, and the, the nurse was like, you know, you really need to take a look at this lady's mouth. You know, her breath is really stinky. We've been using the um, chlorhexidine. It hasn't helped. I go and I take a look, um, and I open the, I ask the lady to open her mouth. And she has this big abscess in her, uh, one of her teeth, um, on the inside aspect of one of her teeth. That it's, I mean, it smells bad, but it also just looks gnarly. She hadn't been eating very well, so I felt really, really terrible that I hadn't seen her a couple of days before that, and I made her sort of suffer those for those two days. But we put her on some antibiotics and got her to the dentist and got her taken care of, um, just a little bit too late. But always make sure that you are paying attention to those things. You can also um, look at patients' motor activity. Usually their motor, their gait should be smooth and coordinated. They should appear comfortable and calm. Uh, you might notice if patients uh, have abnormal posturing, like tripod, if they're having respiratory distress, or if they're in fetal position or guarding, maybe they're guarding their right arm because their shoulder is dislocated. If they have any pain, limping, ataxia, um, excessive fidgeting, involuntary movements, things like that. Next, we're going to talk about the mental status. Uh, the mental status, com this really uh, combines parts of the general survey, the neurologic, and the psychosocial assessment. So when you're talking about the mental status, you're really bringing in all, the, um, all those different components. So we talk about appearance and behavior, their speech and language. We talk about their mood, their thoughts, perceptions, their cognitive function, um, and things like that. So when we're talking about speech and language, um, we're, the, the quality, or sorry, the quantity, the rate of the speech should be stable. You know, the patient should be um, talking relatively regular. <laughs> they shouldn't be talking too fast, too slow, um, too talkative, too silent. We all kind of know those patients that really talk a lot, and they talk really, really fast, and they have this sort of progressive flight of ideas in their speech, that probably isn't all that normal. Uh, you also should look for the volume of the speech. Are they talking too softly? Are they talking too loud? Um, are, what is the, how, is their, how are they articulating words? Do they have a clear speech? Do they have that hyponasal, which you can tell when someone has really bad cold or really bad allergies or if they're feeling really stuffy, they kind of get that nasally talk. Um, you can look at the fluency, which is sort of the entire sort of global picture of their speech, their melody, the rate, the flow, the intonation, and things like that. Um, you might notice uh, some abnormalities like different aphasias, Wernicke uh, aphasia, which is wordy, so W, wordy for Wernicke. Those are the patients that um, say a lot of words, but they don't necessarily make sense. And then Broca is the, um, we always say the speech is broken broken is broken. And then global aphasia, sometimes both, they won't have the um, understanding of what you're saying, uh, and they won't be able to all, to speak uh, the right words as well. You will you might also notice some um, anomic aphasia, where patients just have some trouble finding words. And uh, whenever I start doing online lectures, <laughs> the first couple, um, I tend to have this sort of anomic aphasia. So if you hear me pausing and and, search, and kind of word searching for the right word, then that's kind of an anomic aphasia. Um, it can be brought on by a number of different things. But patients, um, I hope, hopefully, hopefully haven't had a stroke um, and don't have any major depressive or mental health disorder or personality disorders, but um, certainly stress, uh, just being in different environments can bring this on, but they can also, uh, abnormalities in these, in these areas could lead you to consider uh, strokes, um, personality, and mental health disorders. Thoughts and perception. Patients should have logic, um, thought, organization, coherent. Um, if you see some abnormalities in thought, um, thought process, you might see patients with flight of ideas is a really common one where they accelerate the chain, their, you know, their topics change at this accelerated pace in a very fast but generally coherent manner. So you can sort of follow along with what they're what they're saying. You know, they might say, you know, for instance, I would say, oh, last week I was at San Diego. The weather was terrible, but we went to the zoo, and oh, the pandas were so cute. I love black and white. Black and white is my favorite color. My daughter likes blue, though. Blue, you know, so you have this sort of so really rapid progression of ideas, and not one that's um, really well developed, but, they, but you can see where, where that line followed. Whereas someone who has 
um, derailment, they shift topics um, completely without having that apparent relation um, relationship between the two topics. So they might you know be talking about, oh, the weather, the weather was terrible. Uh, oh, I heard this um, speaker at the conference who was talking about CCNE accreditation. Oh, and the grass was really muddy. And, you know, so they're just shifting topics without any sort of clear, rational reason for that. Sometimes you do this with people that you're close to, um, and sometimes you might notice that they follow along. They're able to kind of jump to where you were because maybe it was something you talked about yesterday that you're bringing back up, but you forgot to tell the patient that or the person that you're bringing it back up. So a little bit of that may be um, somewhat um, normal, but circumstantiality is using um, using details that really don't have connection to the point. So um, sometimes you know you're, you're sometimes people make up words here. Sometimes this often goes along with this ne um, neologisms, which is this invented words or invented phrases. And I like to um, have students. You know, years ago when I taught these classes, I would I would always bring a clip of um, of oh what's that guy's name who did all that cocaine and was kind of bipolar um oh shucks anyway so um i would bring a clip of of someone who um had some significant uh, neologisms and circumstantiality uh and have them watch like an interview um and the in the interview you can see this rapid progression. Okay, I just had to pause it because I couldn't remember the guy's name, but it, oh, it's Charlie Sheen. So Charlie Sheen, I used to have students watch one of his interviews, and you know he would talk about how you know he had these thoughts of grandiosity, or he had, he was different, he was just genetically different. You know, he had tiger blood uh, and Adonis DNA or something like that. You know, he would say these words um, that don't really have any connection to the point. Um, and some of them were these invented phrases uh, that you know you make up to kind of to um, prove or to substantiate points, but they don't really substantiate them because you've made them up. This is really common in patients with personality disorders, which he probably has, um, some mental illness, which he definitely had at that time, and patients with delirium, which hmm, cocaine tends to do that to people as well. Okay, next we're going to move on to skin. Skin's a very large um, uh, topic, and I don't want to get too overwhelmed. We'll practice these things in lab as well um, and um, go through some of them. You do need to be really familiar with some of the common skin conditions and be able to see them uh, visually and identify them visually, um, but also know how to describe them as well. I have to start with a, a little thing about skin cancers, basal cells. Uh, these are most common in sun-exposed areas. They tend to be pearly white, translucent, very slow-growing, and they rarely metabolize, uh, metastasize. They're common about 80% of, um, of skin cancers, so they make up about 80% of skin cancers. Squamous cells, these tend to be more crusty and scaly and red and inflamed and ulcerated. Um, these can metastasize, but, metastasize sorry, but very slowly again. This make up about 16% of, of skin cancers. The worst kind of the melanomas, um, these easily metas metastasize to lymph and organ tissue. Um, luckily, they only um, occur, they only make up about 4% of skin cancers. And here's some pictures of them as well. As a clinician, you can use the ABCDE method. A stands for asymmetry. Um, so make sure that the moles uh, compare, you know, compare one side of the mole to the other. If it's asymmetric, that's more likely to be melanoma. So this method is for identifying um, melanoma. Uh, B is for border. Look at the border. Um, it shouldn't be irregular, shouldn't be ragged or notched or blurred. Um, the color should be uh, uh, consistent throughout. There shouldn't be a lot of color variation. Uh, especially in the blues and the blacks. The diameter should be less than six millimeters. That's the, about the base of a pencil eraser, you know, at the end of a pencil, that little eraser part. E is evolution. So this is change. Change in size, shape, symptom, surface, color, all of that. So if there's any change, you want to ask patients um, if, if their skin lesions have changed because they sometimes notice that before um, 
before, obviously before you would probably notice that. Here's a picture for you guys to review. Okay, so now describing rashes. Um, you can start with the color, and then I like to tell, talk about the pattern or the shape. Is it linear? Is it dermatomal? Is it clustered, annular, arciform? So we can go through some of these. Um, do I, oops, sorry, do I show that? We'll go through some of these um, as we go on. So linear, um, linear rashes are going to be just that. They're going to be in a line. Dermatomal tend to be linear or clustered along a dermatome, so in a sort of linear distribution, but they're clustered along that linear distribution. Clustered is just kind of grouped together, but not in that linear distribution. Annular is round, obviously, and arciform is um, kind of semicircle. So skin lesions can also be classified based on, um, based on their um, description and their t the type of skin lesion. Uh, so a macule and a patch, those are the same things, just different sizes. Macule is small and patch is large. These are flat. Um, they're non-palpable, uh, so they're uh, you know, even with the skin. This is things like freckles and lentigos, which are those age spots. Um, a patch, so something bigger, might be a Mongolian spot or a port wine stain. Uh, and we'll show some pictures of that. Here's a picture of a Mongolian spot over here. You can see the, uh, it looks kind of like bruising on, on this child's um, buttocks and then up on the back. And then over on the right, you can see the port wine stain, which is a permanent birthmark that starts out really pink, turns darker red, purple as the child grows, and then, um, and then uh, some, can sometimes appear on the face and the neck, uh, but also other areas of the body. This picture's not really great. You can't really tell, but um, I'm talking about down here, there's that little redness that you can see kind of right in here. And this is a stork bite or a salmon patch. This is flat. You can't, you know, it's not raised at all. Um, these usually disappear by about one year of age. After, if you can feel this, uh, feel a skin lesion, it's probably a papule or a plaque. These are elevated, but still superficial lesions. A papule is going to have, is going to be um, something like a folliculitis. A small, red, solid, elevated skin lesion. It's usually smaller. Um, plaques are going to be larger. These are um, elevated skin lesions that can be flat, or they can be pointed, or they can be rounded. Um, and those include things like, um, you know, the patches associated with with eczema sometimes, or oh, even more commonly, um, psoriasis has a lot of plaques. So here is a uh, skin lesion. This is a really common skin lesion called molluscum contagiosum. You can see it's very characteristic because it has this annular kind of donut look to it and this umbilicated kind of middle. So it's got the hole taken out of the middle. Uh, these are papules. These are painless papules. Um, if they're scratched or injured, then you can they, the child can spread this. It actually can also be a um, sexually transmitted disease in adulthood. Really common in and little kids, though, they tend to be firm, dome-shaped uh, papules that are umbilicated. It's kind of the classic appearance. Here's psoriasis. This is that rapid buildup of that rough, scaly skin that occurs um, as the skin cells rapidly um, increase. Uh, and then those dead cells sort of accumulate and cause that kind of thick, silvery scaling, and, that, and it causes the itchy, dry, inflamed patches. Um, and plaques. These can sometimes be painful, sometimes they can split open and bleed, um, but really common with um, on the extensor surfaces of uh, joints and common with uh, psoriasis. Other primary skin lesions, vesicles and bullae, these are serous filled lesions. Um, so these are filled with a clear fluid, that's what serous means, is clear fluid. So a vesicle can be as large as a pea, um, um, in that case, it's you know, called a vesicle. And then a bullae is bigger than that. You know, this is like a big blister. Um, you know, a blister on your heel, it's, you know, those can get really big. Blister, there's a blistering disease common with elderly. Um, and here's a picture of it, bullous pemphigoid. Or, um, this is a blistering disease and tends to be more associated in um, older, advanced age and elderly. I see it a lot in nursing homes. but um, it's an autoimmune disease, but it causes this blistering in these um, bullae, and it's very itchy and puritic and um, causes a lot of symptoms. But 
you get these large um, bolus uh, lesions or bully lesions that are serous field filled. Sorry. Okay. Um, other primary skin lesions, pustules. These are really common. You probably all know what a pustule is because um, you know they're the ones that are really common with acne. Um, they tend to be um, uh, purulent, uh, filled with purulent fluid like pus. Um, from this point on, remember that um, we, you know, when you're talking about medical terms, uh, it's purulent, not pussy, because you don't want to have to try to spell pussy in a medical um, soap note because <laughs> it doesn't usually look right. So purulent, use the word purulent. Pustules are often associated with hair follicles, but they can also exist independently of the follicles. So pustules can be seen in acne, in yeast infections, in pustular psoriasis, also in folliculitis. Sometimes too, if the if the folliculitis is um, it has a uh, purulent discharge to it. Common with impetigo. This is a really common, um, a really common skin lesion. These are red sores, they erupt, they ooze for a few days, and then the characteristic thing here is the honey-colored crusts. These can sometimes be itchy, but they're generally painless. Um, really common around the skin, uh, sorry, around the nose and mouth and the face of kiddos. It can happen anywhere, though. A nodule is a solid, really kind of more deep mass. It's usually located in the dermis and subcutaneous tissues um, and produces kind of that elevation of the skin surface, but it's not superficial. It's more deep. Nodules are more, um, they tend to be more marble-like. They, um, you can see them with acne processes, but these are going to be those really painful acne, you know, those, those red, deep, painful cystic um, nodule issues. Um, nodules can also be cancerous, neoplasms, uh, like an abnormal um, cellular proliferation that occurs, but a lot of times they, you know, those in those cases, something like a basal cell or a um, squamous cell that we showed you earlier. Uh, large nodules are um, usually called tumors, so over the size of two centimeters, and these can be um, malignant, but many times they're benign. So these lipomas are really common in the skin, uh, and they're usually benign. You can't tell, but this is very, very small. This is a dermatofibroma. Uh, just a marble-like, a little tiny marble-like elevated superficial um, lesion, but deeper and firmer than a papule. It's, you know, this lesion on the leg of a woman that, you know, they keep nicking it when they shower and shave their legs, and they say, you know, what is this little bump? I keep nicking it when I'm shaving. You know, a lot of times they're on the legs, and you can say, oh, it's nothing. It's a dermatofibroma. Patients sometimes might think that it's a um, you know, scar tissue from something a long time ago and just a little bit of scar tissue build up, but usually it's just a benign, meaning non-cancerous dermatofibroma. Uh, a cyst is a deep-seated mass. These are usually filled with liquid or a semi-solid material, uh, some sort of you know um, chunky, amazing material that usually if you're trying to express these, it comes shooting out at 100 miles an hour. Um, so these um, are generally greater than one centimeter. They they're tend to be pretty large. So these can be sebaceous cysts, epidermoid cysts. Uh, sometimes with that cystic acne, they can have that severe cystic, cystic acne. Um, these uh, often need to be opened and drained, so incised and drained. Uh, if they tunnel to the surface eventually, um, if they're infectious, then you can usually kind of express them and get that uh, purulent material or that um, sebaceous material out. A wheel is an irregular bordered, superficial, kind of um, transient lesion, uh, most commonly associated with urticaria, which is commonly called hives. You may note it. Um, note know it as hives. So these are very localized superficial reactions, um, or superficial lesions, sorry, associated with allergic reactions most commonly. A lot of times patients will have hives, they'll come and they'll go. Uh, we don't generally do anything for them unless it's been um, lasting a very long time. A little bit about kids and um, so some special populations, pregnancy and kids. For kids, I tell people, you know, it's a kid's job, it's a child's job to get a rash, and it's the parent's job to worry about them. So then it's your job then uh, to reassure the parents. You know, most rashes in kids are going to be contact dermatitis, 
a viral infection. Um, it, it, sometimes there are some serious infections, but those rashes that are going to be serious are usually associated with high fever, fussiness, um, and um, you know, more symptoms. That being said, there's some very common rashes that you know, patient, a, a, a small child develops a high fever, the fever goes away, and then the rash shows up, and the, those are those common viral exanthems. So, um, but generally speaking, rashes without fever or fussiness are generally benign. They're going to be the contact dermatitis, the eczemas, the, you know, they got into something type of thing. For pregnancies, some of the really common skin things, you'll learn this in women's health again, but the linea nigra, that line that goes down the belly. You might also see this. It's called puffs, pyritic, urticaric, papules of pregnancy, something. There's another P in there too. Anyway, um, my cousin had this, and it is terrible. Um, she had had a child before this, so she had these striae, you know, the little stretch marks on her tummy, and she had these pup lesions all over the striae. So she was scratching and itching, and it was terrible because your treatment options are also limited because the people are pregnant. You don't want to treat them with things. So warts um, can be anywhere. So uh, they typically appear on the hands, but you can see them anywhere, especially, you know, the genital warts and things like that. But common warts, usually on the hands. Flat warts can be on the face, on the forehead. Um, they're commonly found in children. They typically go away. Genital warts, usually, again, found in the genitals, the pubic area, between the thighs, can also be inside the um, vagina and near the anal canal, and sometimes inside the anal canal. Plantar warts are found generally on the soles of feet. Uh, Subungual and periungual warts are um, on or in and around the uh, fingernails and toenails. So here's a picture of some flat warts. Uh, they tend to have this sort of, you know, cauliflower-ish look and kind of spread out. Um, you can, they can be solitary or they can spread too. So this is a picture of a benign, it's a wart-like lesion. It's benign, it's non-cancerous. It grows um, on the surface of the skin, so you can peel this off, and it kind of has a red abraded surface underneath. Um, they can be black, brown, yellow, um, but the, the hallmark here is that they have this stucco appearance, where if you put stucco, you know, cement type stuff on your fingernails, and then, you know, flipped your fingernails at the patient's back, then these sort of have that appearance where they're sort of stuck on. Um, and this is called seborrheic keratosis, a very common and benign condition. You'll see it a lot, especially on uh, people as they age. This shouldn't be any big surprise. These, this picture is acne on the right. On the left, it's um, an acne rosa rosacea, so a type of acne that's typically in uh, women who are a little bit older. Um, and it's in that butterfly distribution on their face. So it's not, um, and it's tr treated a little bit differently than acne. Um, with the comedones and the um, blackheads. On the um, left here, this picture here, you can see this lesion here. This is a precancerous actinic keratosis. So it's different than the seborrheic keratosis. This is an actinic keratosis. These are rough, dry patches, um, usually on sun exposed areas like the face, scalp, the back of the hands, um, really common. Sometimes the, the ears around the ears. Over here, this is a picture, hopefully you guys recognize what this is because we had a picture similar. This is a basal cell cancer. It's that translucent nodule. Um, it's, it can sometimes spread a little bit and then have that depressed center and elevated border. Sometimes it'll um, um, open up and crust a little bit, and the patient might say, you know, I've had this lesion. It just won't go away. It's been here for, for months and months. That should make you suspicious that it's um, a basal cell. This is shingles. You guys should all recognize this. See how it's so sort of linear? I mean, it's in this sort of line, sort of, um, this is called a dermatome. So it's clustered along this dermatome. A lot of times it starts first with the burning or shooting pain, then the tingling or the itching, then this rash appears, um, and then potentially blisters later. Uh, over here on this gentleman, you can't really tell very well from the picture, but this redness going across the bridge of his nose and onto his cheeks, you can see the scaling a little bit on his nose and, and the little fine scales. This is seborrheic dermatitis. Not to be confused with seborrheic, uh, seborrheic keratosis. Those are those stucco-looking things. This is seborrheic dermatitis. Uh, both of them benign, um, but it's very common in that, you know, to cause this red, scaly, itching skin. Uh, sometimes seen in the eyebrows and in other kind of oily areas. 
milia for babies you'll see milia here's this pinpoint kind of smooth white raised areas there's no inflammation no erythema you see them on the chin and the nose leave them alone tell patients to leave tell parents to leave them alone um, here you can see the baby acne um, unfortunately it happens uh, you know between the two week and three month mark so right when babies are getting really cute and you want to take their pictures a lot then you can get these sort of baby acne these small red bumps on the baby's cheek tell the patients to leave them alone tell the parents I guess to leave the leave them alone don't treat them don't pick at them leave them alone you can see the cradle cap on this child's head here and here and then here cradle cap actually is a type of seborrheic dermatitis you know that um, what I was talking about with that guy who had the oily kind of um, on his face and the bridge of the nose a few a few um, slides back. It's this is a type of that, but it's a thicker um, type. So this is a thick, yellow, crusty, greasy patches on the baby's scalp. It happens commonly. Um, they can kind of use a bristle brush and get rid of them. And um, over here, another really common childhood thing: diaper rash, candidal diaper rash. This looks like a a, a candidal infection. Um, if it was beefier, bright, beefy red, then you'd be more concerned for um, bacterial, but this looks classic candial diaper rash. You have that kind of erythematous papules and pustules over that vulval perineal area, the satellite lesions kind of every once in a while out here. You can see a little satellite lesion. This is an annular lesion, slightly raised. You can't really tell that it's raised in the picture, but you can tell that it's annular. Uh, if you could tell, if you could scrape it, it was crusted. There's sent the central clearing here, right? The rash doesn't go in the middle, so it's this annular. Um, um, it can be itchy. Anybody know what this is? Really common. This is tinea corporis. So if you said ringworm, you're also right, but call it tinea corporis now, which is what it actually is. Uh, so that ring grows outward as the infection spreads, and the center area becomes less actively infected there. This is a picture, um, don't mind this lesion, but look at the picture of the person's leg. This is that kind of what we call brawny color, that brawny edema. This is um, a texture, a color and a texture change, which is really typical of chronic venous insufficiency. So you get this thickened, kind of indurated uh, liposclerosis area down the leg from, um, you know, where your blood, your blood circulates down your legs and, and then sort of doesn't circulate back, so you get um, the red blood cells sort of um, break open and you get that um, um, brawny color from those lysed red blood cells. We'll talk a little bit about uh, wounds, pressure, injuries, sorry I forgot to update this, arterial ulcers and um, venous ulcers. So um, pressure uh, injuries, um, also called the cubitus ulcers, uh, we, we classify them by location. They tend to be caused by four different factors, so pressure, shear, friction, and moisture. And when more, more than two of those are combined, then you really increase the risk of pressure-related injuries. Um, so risk factors include patients who have been hospitalized, patients who are immobile, have any sort of sensory impairment that they don't feel as well, so patients with diabetes who don't feel their feet, um, patients who are um, elderly, um, and patients who have malnourishment are um, at increased risk. And then we um, stage them based on severity from unstageable and then severity uh, one, stage one through four. So we'll go through some of those. So unstageable are the ones that you can't really tell. You know, they have a thick eschar or the slough that covers the visibility of the ulcer base. So you can't see the base of the ulcer. Um, in that case, it's an unstageable um, pressure ulcer. You know it's probably more, you know it's more than stage one since stage one is just non-blanching skin. Um, and that this non-blanching skin is usually over a bony prominence um, in, in darker skin patients, it can be kind of a duskier area um, instead of kind of that non-blanching because you can't always see the, um, the redness in someone who's darker skin. So stage one, think, you know, just the non-blanching skin, the redness, you know, you crossed your legs too long and you have this sort of redness that uh, won't go away. Um, fortunately for you and I, when this happens, within, you know, five, ten minutes, it goes away. Um, but in these patients who have these other issues with mobility, um, friction, shear, or pressure, all those things, it doesn't necessarily. So this, this patient, this is unstageable because you can't see the base of the ulcer. This also is unstageable. Stage one, then again, is the red non-blanching. 
Stage two is partial loss of the dermis. There's no slough. This includes something like a blister or a shiny, um, dry, shallow ulcer. Stage three is going to be full thickness. It, it can have slough, or does, but doesn't always have to, so with or without slough. But there's no bone, muscle, or tendon involvement. So uh, to classify a stage three versus a stage four is that tendon, bone, or muscle involvement. So this is a stage three. You can see there's slough here. This is that yellow kind of slough um, stuff. But you don't see any bones, any tendons, or anything. So this is stage three. Stage four is also full thickness, with or without a scar or slough, but there's exposed bone, muscle, or tendon. Um, that leaves the patient to high risk for osteomyelitis, infection, things like that. So here you can see tendon there. Sometimes you can see bone. The complications really are infections. So how do you know if these things are infected? A lot of times they're gonna, patients are going to be on antibiotics for this anyway, but um, a lot of times they're just treated with, um, with wound care, which can... Um, um, treat the symptoms without antibiotics, but if the patient has any increased exudate, there's increased odor, if there's a lot more pain all of a sudden, or if there's surrounding tissue redness or inflammation, then that can indicate that um, there's infection. And um, even if the patient's on antibiotics or getting good wound care, if the bone is exposed, the patient is at risk for osteomyelitis with, with these type of infections. And osteomyelitis is when the um, bone, sorry, uh, when the bone gets infected. You know, when the tissue is so infected that it goes down into the bone and the bone gets infected, and that's very hard to treat and usually requires amputations. Although I have had some patients who have refused amputation and they've been on antibiotics, usually IV antibiotics, for six, eight, nine months, so a very long time. Arterial ulcers are usually found on the feet, sometimes in the heels and the toes, but in the lateral malleolus, so that's um, not the, um, you know, the inside, but more the lateral side the lateral malleolus of the ankle. Um, usually this skin is white and shiny. Um, usually they're full thickness and um, can become gang gangrenous and get that kind of black um, issue. They can have this sort of uh, punched out appearance where they, they look like uh, they're nice, nice round circular punched out lesions. Um, the pain tends to be worse when the leg is elevated and it gets better when the legs get dependent. So this is how you can differentiate arterial ulcers from uh, vascular ulcers, ulcers, excuse me, because those things are kind of different in vascular ulcers. Arterial ulcers um, are ranked by the ACC and AHA um, based on the stages of peripheral arterial disease. So the first one is asymptomatic. The second one is claudication, that pain at rest, you know, the leg pain at rest. And then three is that critical limb ischemia, where the, there's ulcer formation on the legs, on the toes, the ankles, or the feet. And um, there can have some gangrene or some gangrenous um, issues at this point. Acute limb ischemia is when peripheral arterial disease gets really bad. And these are associated with the five Ps, pain, paralysis, paresthesia, pulselessness, and pallor. I saw a patient with um, one of your colleagues, uh, who's a couple semesters above you, um, she was in with me in clinical the other day, and the nurse said, "Hey, you know, so and so's leg is um, is pale, and he's been having pain in it for the last, you know, uh, couple hours. So um, things like that, you have to go look at right away." So I went and looked at it, and yes, it was painful. He couldn't move it. Therapy had just worked with him, or tried to work with him, and said, "You know, he he doesn't have much sensation in it. He's not moving it very well today. I uh, couldn't feel pulses, and it was pale and cold also." So we sent him. Um, we sent him out acute um, so that he could get the services that he needed right away, which is usually revascularization to avoid um, to avoid having to have amputations and things like that. So here is that nice punched out lesion. See how, how circular annular is? You can see how the skin surrounding it is kind of that white. There's no edema, which is also you know, more of a peripheral vascular issue when you think about the vas per um, peripheral vascular people that have that chronic venous stasis. You can also see some gangrenous things on the toes. Most ulcers on the toes are going to be arterial instead of um, uh, venous. Here's an ischemic um, gangrenous toe. Uh, oftentimes these will shrink up, mummify, and put, um, auto amputate or amputate by themselves. You'll, you'll find toes in, in people's socks and in their beds sometimes. Um, it's happened more than once, um, but this can occur all over um, the feet. 
as well. I think I have some pictures where um, I have a patient with um, gangrenous uh, auto amputating the leg and his entire arm too. It's pretty crazy. I'll try to find those. Uh, venous ulcers, so in stark relation, the venous ulcers, in comparison, tend to be um, between the knee and the calf, you know, between the knee and the ankle on that lower leg, but not generally on the feet and on the toes, like the ulcer, or like the arterioles. These are generally associated with stasis dermatitis um, and tortuous veins. They're often irregular, um, shallow, and painless lesions. Um, they still, they can have pain in them as well, though. So you can see how this is irregular shaped, um, this too, irregular, irregular, and they're not really on the feet. But you notice that there's a lot of swelling here. The color is a little bit more, um, you know, that kind of gets it to be a little bit more red because of those red lysed red blood cells. You can see some more. Okay, so moving on to the hair. There's only a couple things I want to talk to you about hair. Normally, hair should be evenly distributed. It should be consistent in texture. Uh, you might find that it's silky and fine or coarse and spare, but as long as it hasn't changed for the patient, then that's probably a normal variant. You may also see some generalized thinning, um, which can be common with aging, um, some male pot pattern baldness for males who have a family um, history or um, who that is hereditary for. Abnormally, patients shouldn't have a change in texture. It shouldn't change all of a sudden. They shouldn't have sudden hair loss. Um, they shouldn't have discrete circular patches of hair loss either. And they definitely shouldn't have things crawling through their hair, um, jumping around in your office onto your office furniture, like ukus and, and head lice. My friend worked in Boston, um, in a community clinic in Boston, and she said that, because um, I still have never seen head lice, but luckily, luckily, I don't know how, but my kids have never had it. My friends, I know my friends have had, my friends' kids have had it, but um, I've never, you know, had to be there and, and discover it. And I've never seen a patient with head lice. So I'm going to knock on some wood now um, just to make sure I don't. But my friend Kat, uh, was working at a community clinic in Boston, and she said, she called me one evening and said, oh, my gosh, I just saw a patient um, and I looked at them and I could see their hair moving. Like you could see this sort of wave of things on the, on the head moving. They were, they were so infested with head lice that it looked like their head, you know, that their hair was moving visibly. And uh, it just made my skin crawl and my, my head itches right now, actually. <laughs> Uh, so look for those sort of things. Look for, you can actually even have, you know, psoriasis along the hairline and things like that. But um, some other common diagnoses like uh, tinea capitis is very common in hair, especially in little kids. It's sort of like ringworm, but on the head. So this is this dermatophyte infection. Um, the dermatophyte, um, depending on the location of the dermatophyte, we call it different things. So tinea capitis, cap is head, right? You put a cap on the head. So uh, if the dermatophyte is on the head, we call it tinea capitis. If the dermatophyte is on the body, we call it tinea corporis. If it's in um, the on the foot, like athlete's foot, we call it tinea pedis. So depending on where the dermatophyte is, uh, we call we call these things different things. So tinea capitis looks sort of like that sebaceous dermatitis, um, you know, that little cradle cap that kids can get, but this isn't. This is um, a dermatophyte thing. So um, it tends to be present from days, sometimes to month, and this can actually um, become uh, the scaling sort of wet, a little bit angrier looking lesion, and then it kind of can dry out. Uh, and then sometimes you find it like this with that thick scales, uh, but sometimes it's going to be a little more fine and silvery. But it ten t typically is very um, um, annular. Um, and well demarcated, so you can clearly see the borders, the differentiating in borders. Um, and it has that sort of patchy alopecia, so there's no hair in there. This is a picture of alopecia areata. This is an immune disease that targets the hair follicles. Um, so these patients will complain of sudden patchy hair loss, and it's distressing to them because it um, tends to be in large 
clumps. Sometimes there is a generalized thinning, but um, the tr the big alopecia areata is really this generalized clumps of hair that come that come out. Um, the normal skin underlying this is completely normal. So those bare areas, if you check the skin, it'd be normal. So it looks like normal skin. It doesn't have that, you know, any scales or crusting or anything like that. Um, looking at the nail examination, normal nails. We probably all know what normal nails look like. Just look down at your hand. And abnormal findings are going to be clubbing, nail discolorations, white, yellow, blue, dark. I have a friend um, who has a family member right now um, who is undergoing um, cancer treatment for a, type, um, a malignancy uh, that occurred from a skin lesion underneath the fingernail. So if you notice abnormal um, periungal or um, so, you know, skin lesions, make sure you get those checked out. Uh, pitting, spooning, bow's line, mees lines, terry lines, there's all these different lines um, that you might see with your nail examination. Uh, you can see them in your book and, and take a look at them, but they can be associated with a variety of different things. Here's a really classic picture of spoon nail. Um, this is associated with um, uh, iron deficiency anemia, sometimes hypothyroid disease, heart disease, um, iron issues like hemochromo, um, hemochromatosis, hemochromatosis, yeah, hemochromatosis, um, where they get this sort of scooped out pitting look. Um, and then here's a picture of Terry's nails. These are those kind of white, um, the tip of each nail um, has that kind of dark band, and this is um, common with some liver issues, like the liver disease, hepatitis. Also common with CHF and diabetes, um, kind of that chronic illness picture. Bow's lines are those indentations that run across the nail. Um, this is caused when the growth underneath the cuticle is interrupted, usually by significant disease or illness or trauma too. Um, so, um, and then over on the other side here, on the right side, you can see the onychomycosis. This is a fungal infection. Uh, that can cause onycholysis, which is that fingernail, um, you know, this fingernail can actually loosen and separate from the nail bed and become brittle and thick and actually um, break off and become problematic. Hard to treat, it requires a long treatment. Okay, guys, so sorry that was very long, but um, we'll review this stuff again in lab and we'll go over some um, other, you know, differential diagnosis and pictures and case studies and things like that. So I'll uh, see you guys later.